Turn in your scriptures, if you would, to the 14th chapter of the book of Psalms as we continue our series on Psalms. We're going chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and expository teaching on this book. I believe it's important for us to put our finger in the Word and just keep digging away, learning, growing, and all God has for us. The title of this message today is The Generation of the Righteous. And in the hour we live, I believe this is such an important message that God would have us be raised up as a generation of the righteous. Let me pray, and then we'll read and get into the text. Father, I thank you for the word of God, and I pray that it would pierce our hearts. I pray that it would speak deeply into who we are in these last days, would teach us how to live holy and righteous and just in an hour of trouble and trial and tribulation, that we would not cower or fear or fall back, but Lord, we would forge ahead and do all that you've commanded us to do with courage and boldness and power of the Holy Spirit. I pray you would bless my words now. Let them touch many hearts, many lives, uh, and, and impact, uh, you know, even if you would be so gracious, Lord, to, to impact communities and cities and nations. We give thanks for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me read Psalm chapter 14 to you, the whole chapter. To the choir master of David, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not even one. Have they no knowledge? All the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat up bread and do not call upon the Lord. Verse 5, there, there they are in great terror. For God is with the generation of the righteous. Verse 5 is where we get the title of our message today. You would shame the plan, speaking again of the evil. You would, you evil people, would shame the plans of the poor. But the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that the salvation for Israel would come out of Zion when the Lord restores the fortunes of his people. Let Jacob rejoice. Let Israel be glad. Where we get the great theme of today's message in this 14th chapter is found in verse 5. And I want to highlight, highlight these words, the generation of the righteous. And this, this word here shows the great contrast between a generation that's steeped in wickedness and corruption, vileness, and rebellion towards God, and how that is contrasted and in contention with God's holy remnant, the people of God that are God-fueled, God-inspired, God-touched, God-ordained to be worshipers. They are the generation of the righteous, the people set apart, a holy generation, a royal priesthood. And we see these two generations living together, but oftentimes contending with one another and clashing with one another. <clears throat> And I believe there are five realities of this generation of the righteous, five realities that, that they see in their own life. And I want to list them first, then we'll go through them line by line. The first one is that they live in a crooked and wicked generation. They have an understanding of the hour in which they live. Secondly, they have seen many among them who have fallen away. Third, they watch out for themselves or they watch over themselves, their heart, their soul, their spiritual life. Number four, they are a terror to a wicked generation. <clears throat> and lastly, they are a generation that cries out for the freedom, deliverance, and for salvation of the nations, salvation, a, a spiritual awakening in their nation. And as a result, they live a life of amazing joy and, a, and of worshipful gladness. This is beautiful to see that God is raising up in this last days a generation of the righteous and they are looking at these five areas in their life to be fruitful and to be all that God wants them to be, all that God wants us to be. Let's look at these, break them down one at a time. Number one, they understand that they live in a crooked generation. Verses one and two, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. That's the corrupt generation. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven to children of men to see if there are any who understand or any seeking after God. They don't believe in God. They're not seeking after God. They're not looking to God. And as a result, they've become corrupt. 
Uh, there's a corruption in their heart. There's a degradation in their heart. There's a moving away from righteousness, whether it be an individual or in a, even in a church or possibly even in a nation, as we're seeing in America, there's a moving away, an ungodliness, a flood of filth touching the land. And we see this is exactly what David was crying out to God in this very precious and powerful prayer. And he first does this. He describes the condition of the world and the worldliness around him. And those who would live as righteous in the midst of a crooked generation understand that the world is unbelieving, number one. Number two, corrupt. Number three, doing abominable deeds. It's not just their heart is unbelieving or that they're not just corrupt in their thinking, but now their deeds, they're doing their abominable deeds. We see this happening around the world. We, we hear of things and, and we rejoice over the good news such as here in America, the reversal of the horrible decree of the Roe versus Wade decision 50 years ago. And we rejoice that it's been overturned, but we understand there are still abominable deeds. State after state is adding new legislation, corrupt politicians, corrupt leaders, ungodly men and ungodly women who uh, hate evil, uh, hate good and love evil. And what they're doing is setting forth new proposals to <clears throat> cause more abominable deeds to take place. It's not just with abortion, it's with sexual immorality. The flood of sexual filth has moved, as we've studied before in Romans chapter 1, it's moved from, from uh, sexual perversion to homosexuality, then into number three, to a depraved mind. And that's the hour we're living in now. It's bypassed these other things and now has moved into a depraved mind. And it's out of this depraved mind that they lose their faith in God. They lose their trust in God and become corrupt and abominable. And it says, none who do good, none understand, none seek after God. The second thing that the righteous generation would understand is that they have come to realize that they shouldn't expect things to be otherwise. They pray that God would move mightily. They work for righteousness in their church, in their city, in their family, in their nation, in their community. But they realize that they live in a fallen world, that sin has marred all of creation from mankind to the earth and the universe itself. <clears throat> And they're not expecting it to be otherwise. Or maybe a better way of saying it is they're not surprised when they see the wickedness being pervasive all around them. It's not like they're dismayed. It's not like they're overwhelmed. It's not like they're cowering in fear now because they seem to think wickedness is too prevailing and it's too hopeless and it's too far gone and, uh, and we're too much a remnant. We're too much of a small minority and, 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 we're, and, and so many are falling away that you can get to the place where you can despair. But the generation of the righteous are as bold as lions. No matter what's going on around them, they don't fear, fear they don't cower, they're not surprised or dismayed. And I want to encourage you, my friends, don't be surprised when the world acts like the world. When, when we see certain things happening in the world, even more in America now than ever before, corporations are supporting evil uh, purposely, intentionally, and vocally, even companies like Disneyland that was once a bastion for family fun and joy and clean entertainment has become now, as I've been saying today, part of this flood of filth around the land. They're doing it without blushing, without shame. And instead of being surprised and dismayed, like, why are they doing that? How can they do that? Is, is to realize the world acts like the world. Sin follows sin. It becomes worse. It becomes more corrupt. It becomes more abominable in God's sight. They are given over to worse and worse situations. Paul used Psalm chapter 14. Turn with me, if you have your Bibles still open, to the book of Romans. And Romans in the third chapter, Paul takes David's text and speaks them now in a condition not of uh, hundreds of years before in David's time, but now in the Roman and the Jerusalem culture even, because in this Jerusalem culture where David was speaking to, he wasn't speaking just to heathens, he was speaking to his own people. He was writing this book, these Psalms, to be sung in the, in the, in the temple, in the tabernacle, in the, in the church, so to speak. And so it's, it's a prayer, it's a warning for his own people. In Romans chapter 3, we see now it's generations later, but Paul facing the same thing that David faced in his generation and in the end, at verse 10, it says, As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. 
No one understands, no one seeks after God. Sounds familiar, right? Right out of Psalm 14. All have turned aside, they've become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave and they use their tongues to deceive. There's venom and ass under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood and their paths are ruin and misery. The way of peace they have not known and there's no fear of God before their eyes. It, it is, the reason I bring those, that passage up from Romans to compare it to 14 is to say, generation after generation after generation until Jesus comes back with judgment and with righteousness. Until that time, there's going to be this battle. There's going to be this confrontation. There's going to be a worldliness that is pervasive in the land. And we're going to have to be a righteous generation, generation after generation. The one before us had to stand strong. Now we have to stand strong. It's the military. Our children have to be stand strong. And by the way, I'm not afraid of what my children and my grandchildren have to face. I, matter of fact, they were born for such a time as this. God knew the hour was going to be such as it is, and he knew that these kids in this next generation would be so on fire for God that they could handle it. And not only handle it, but they could be an influence. They could be light. They could be salt in the midst of darkness and perversiveness. And we see what God is doing and so I'm hopeful for this next generation. I'm hopeful for young people. I'm hopeful for young men and women of God who believe that no matter what happens in culture, no matter what happens in the world around them, they're gonna stand faithful. They're gonna stand true. They're gonna stand strong. They're gonna dig into the word of God. They're gonna fall on their knees and crying out for righteousness in the midst of a perverse generation. And I am thankful that God gave me children for this generation. And I'm not afraid for my grandchildren as they grow up, as things grow worse and worse, they're gonna grow brighter and brighter, stronger and stronger, more and more faithful, more and more able to stand faithful in hard times because my generation grew up in materialism and comfort and ease. And because of that, we've adopted a materialistic so-called gospel and we want comfort and ease. And when it doesn't happen, we're alarmed, we're surprised, we're caught off guard and many fall away because they don't get their way. We need to be a different kind of people, a people that understand no matter what happens around us, we are faithful to the word of God and to the God of the word. And we're going to do all that God has commanded us to do. So number one, they understand they live in a difficult situation and they're not alarmed nor surprised. Look further ahead to 2 Timothy just continuing this theme, 2 Timothy uh, chapter, uh, let's take a look at Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. But understand this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For people will be lovers of selves, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of God in this but denying the power. Avoid such people. For among them, those who creep into households and capture weak women and burdened with sins. Verse seven then, always learning but never able to arrive at the truth. Uh, and then verse 10, but you, see, speaking of the contrast now, here's the righteous generation. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, and my steadfastness. Uh, Paul writing to Timothy shows the contrast between what's happening in every generation, the righteous with the unrighteous, the holy with the unholy. And he lists this, things that are going wrong in society in his day, same list today. It's unchanged. The sin nature really is unchanged, and it will remain unchanged until Jesus comes back. And those who are transformed, who become part of the righteous generation, are those who follow the teaching of the word of the Lord, follow Jesus with our whole heart, come to know him, come to love him, come to honor him, refuse to give up to worldliness or the pressures and, and, and even the pleasures of the world, but they live wholeheartedly for, for Jesus. This is, this is throughout scripture. I, I could go on and on. We could start in the garden. We could speak of the flood. We could speak of unbelieving Israel that had to be judged in the wilderness. We could speak of Jerusalem in Jesus' day, how he said, I would have, that you would have come to me, but you refused, and judgment is waiting for you. It, it, it's, it's the whole spirit of Sodom and Gomorrah repeating itself generation after generation. And as a result of this, we go to the second point, and this is found in, if you'll go back to Psalm 14, look at verse 3. 
They have all turned aside together. They have become corrupt, and there's no one who does good, not even one. They have no knowledge, uh, and all are e e evil doers. It says here they have, first thing we see here is they turned aside. As I said just a minute ago, this, this text I don't believe was written exclusively, although it could have impacted the heathen nations around David and, and, and the people of God during his generation. But I believe it was primarily written for the people of God, for those who said that they were believers, who said that they were Hebrews, Israelites, children of God, but yet their hearts had turned aside. You, you can't turn aside unless you were moving in that direction one place. You were heading towards becoming part of the righteous generation. And then David says, but they turned aside. They are backslidden. They, 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 are, they are falling away. Look, look back one more time to 2 Timothy. I know we're moving around a lot in Scripture, but it's important to look at these. 2 Timothy chapter 4 says, I charge you in the presence of God, verse 1, and the, Jesus Christ, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearance of his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teachings. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but will have itching ears and will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn aside, same thing, turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded. Here's a description now. The contrast is seen once again. Here's the generation of the righteous, always sober-minded, always enduring suffering, always doing the work of evangelists, always fulfilling your ministry. There's a description right there of the generation of the righteous who are living faithful in the midst of the dark hour of a corrupt generation. But so many, David warns, and Paul warns Timothy, so many are not going to endure. They're, they're going to turn aside. They're going to fall away. Back to Psalm 14, it says, they have turned aside, next word is together. And it might be easy to overlook that word and just say, wow, how horrible it is. It's the corruption and the turning aside. But it's, it's a joint effort. It's a coming together. It's a communal effort. It's a, a discussion group. It's a, a, a Facebook influence. It's a social media trend. It's a, it's a, it's a party spirit. It's a movement. It's, a, it, it's the prevailing winds of false doctrine. It's, it's the cultural norms. And it's sadly, probably most sadly of all, it's a church that adopts the cultural trends of the world. It says, we'll look like the world, we'll act like the world, we'll talk like the world, we'll dress like the world, we'll try to be hip like the world, we'll try to put on shows and entertainment like the world. And then the gospel goes missing because they've turned aside. And once they've turned aside, they, they begin to do it together. They find groups of people. That's happening all around the world today as a group, as a culture, as a generation. Influences pull many away. Television pulls many away education system today is trying to educate our system to believe in the most perverse things. And it's, it's together. There's a, there's a, the Psalm 2 says that the, the people have, have together imagined vain things and come against the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we're seeing that in our generation as well. And as a result of it, it says they have become corrupt. If, to become something means you weren't something before. They've become corrupt. Maybe you got saved out of sin and you are thankful for what God's done, but you have to be careful because you don't want to move back into the old world, putting, putting on again the things of the flesh, where Paul says to put off those things, crucify the flesh, and live. Make sure you don't become part of a, a wicked and corrupt generation. Secondly, or excuse me, uh, so, so the first thing we saw is they live in a, cro a crooked generation. The second thing we're seeing is they, that many, they have seen many people fall away. And thirdly, they watch over themselves. They see so many falling away because of the prevailing winds of culture. And, and when they see many falling away, instead of slipping slightly into it or trying to accommodate culture or trying to be acceptable to culture, what they do instead is they say, no, I'm going to watch over my soul. I'm going to guard my heart. I'm going to call on the Lord. I'm going to, going to stay faithful. I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit's power to keep me in from this hour of temptation. I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to do a supernatural work in my life. They watch over their own souls. They watch over their spiritual condition. 
1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, take heed lest you fall away. The warning there is, is that you fall into the old patterns of this world, that together you go with that crowd that's marching away from the things of God. And here is a deep and important warning. Take heed now. Guard your heart. Guard your heart from influences. Guard your heart from false teachings. Guard your heart from worldly indoctrination. Guard your heart from things that are happening around you. Guard your heart from, like I said, education or entertainment and, and even the compromise that's happening in the church. Guard your heart from a watered-down gospel. Guard your heart from a church that compromises with sin, with, with worldly influences. Guard your heart. One of the ways this generation of the righteous does this is found in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. It says, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls. One of the things about the righteous generation is they watch over their souls. One of the ways we watch over our souls is to have a faithful man of God, a pastor, an elder, a leader in the church and in our in our community, our Christian community, who understands that they have been given the faithful charge as pastoring, as shepherding the souls that are under their care. And, and we engage in this pastoral form of care and protection. Shepherd is the one who guards the flock, who, who brings the flock into streams of living water. And so we obey them. We, we, and and that, boy, that, talk about a countercultural ideal idea is, is, is this idea of, of uh, obeying leaders. We, we live in, in a world that has cast off all restraints. We live in a generation that will not tolerate someone telling them, leading them, guiding them to the truth. Rather, they, just, they want to live in their own rebellious untruth. <clears throat> and so we, as the generation of the righteous, must find faithful pastors <clears throat> and and, and to carefully avoid what is very prevailing as this word together again, together so many false doctrines, false winds of truth, uh, of, of untruth. <clears throat> so many churches have gathered together around those teachings that we need to be careful, not only that we find faithful, godly men to pastor us, but that we avoid false teachers and false teaching. Too often, if you go to somebody's library in their home or hear what they listen to online, you'll see that they listen to faithful teaching from the Word of God. Then the very next sermon that they listen to or the very next book that they pick up <clears throat> is by a heretic, a false teacher, someone who's tickling their ears, someone who, who, who tries to lure them into ungodly doctrines. Three, very briefly, I want to mention to you. One has been spoken of quite often in the church for those who preach righteousness, and that is to run, to flee the prosperity movement, the health wealth and prosperity, this, this hyper charismatic uh, idea of whatever you think and whatever you say out of your mouth, you're creating that reality. And so you're going to want material goods and higher positions in the world and success everywhere you go. The only kind of success a man or woman of God in this generation looks for is godly success, godly obedience, godly reverence, godly adher adherence to the things that God has called forth in his word and we receive from him in prayer through the Holy Spirit and we live that out. And so we run from this false teaching. We run from these people that tell you uh, life is nothing but comfort and ease. They're, they're the ones who, um, who, 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 who sell a line of goods that telling you just come and listen to their false teaching. They don't call it that obviously. Come and listen to this stuff and we will make sure that your life is just nothing but a bed of roses all the time and you get everything you want and God is just uh, someone that you can use. They won't use that language, but you'll leave their meetings or leave their teachings and you'll, what you'll be thinking about is something that you can gain, some benefit that you have. And it's not usually a righteous benefit. It's usually a materialistic benefit. Run from the prosperity movement. <clears throat> Secondly, I would say run from performance-oriented churches. Churches that are more concerned about how well things are going on the stage than they are concerned about the condition of your heart. There's no preaching against sin. There's no preaching for righteousness. It's preaching tips and tidbits and helpful hints. It's, it's putting on a good show. It's having smoke and mirror and lights. It's having a band that equals the, the hottest uh, pop rock stars in, in the world. The, 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 the culture is one of, uh, of uh, uh, just, uh, you know, 
drinking and smoking and sleeping around and there's no conflict, that there's no contention against that. It's just we want to draw a big crowd, run from churches that are performance-oriented where you don't hear the gospel. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't have good singing and we shouldn't have good ministry and we shouldn't have uh, people who are gifted in the calling to do the things, whether it be worship or teaching of the word. But if you're there and somebody's just telling stories and they're just putting on a show, run from that. Run from prosperity, run from performance, the entertainment culture that is so pervasive in the church today. Number three, and lastly, run from what we call the progressive movement in the church today. The progressive movement is a is part of, really, it's just a rehashing of the liberal church that denies things like the virgin birth or the second coming or <clears throat> uh, Jesus dying on the cross or being raised again or that there's a heaven and a hell. It's just more Jesus was a good man and he's loving and, he, and, and we are, and the church needs to move away from that old school fire and brimstone and move away from uh, ancient hymns and move away from believing the inspiration of all scripture as being inspired by God, infallible word of God. And now they're just kind of talking about how they see the world. And, and you'll hear things like, uh, my God is a God of love. And he would never, he would never send anyone to hell. He would never judge anyone, anybody for uh, uh, sexual immorality. He would never judge anybody for adultery. He would never judge anybody for fornication. He's just, he's a loving God. He understands we live in a world where we have these urges. And, and so we just want to come together and learn how to love one another and how to be gracious and how to, how to try to draw the world into this so-called false gospel, this so-called gospel, which is a, actually a false gospel. Rather than falling for those deceptions, the righteous generation that God is calling to be stirred today will be one who finds faithful pastors, avoiding the false teachers, and look to simple, humble, faithful, godly, Bible-preaching, holy living, worldliness-contending men of God, men who stand strong. They don't have to be charismatic. They don't have to be supernaturally, they don't have to be uh, super gifted. They have to be supernaturally gifted. They don't have to be gifted in, in, in the way the world looks at that, but they have to be faithful and true. And oh, that God would raise up a generation. As I speak today about this generation of the righteous, let me just speak to the pastors and leaders that you throw off all the chains of culture around you and all the pulls and, and draws and influences of, of the, the, even the Christian culture around you that says you have to grow a big church and you have to put on a show and you have to, to compromise the, and water down the gospel. Throw it off and go back to the faithful word of God. Don't turn aside. Watch over even you pastors and leaders, watch over your own soul and connect and uh, be connected to people around you that are going to stir up godliness and righteousness in your heart. <clears throat> A third thing we see is as they watch over their souls is, is one, of the, one of the things that caused these people to lose faith in God and become corrupt and turn aside and, and not one of them being able to be good is because in verse, the last part of verse four, and they do not call upon the name of the Lord. Nothing that we have mentioned in verse one through four is any problem for the Lord to solve. Is, is, there's not one of those things that are too difficult. Somebody's unbelieving, they, 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 they say there is no God. God can come down from heaven and in an instant cause that heart to be on fire for God, a person is corrupt, God can change that corrupt heart, that abominable heart, that heart, that, uh, that, that behavior that no one does good, uh, that, that none seek after God. God can change all those things. But the change comes when we call upon the name of the Lord. Call upon the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. And not only saved, call upon the name of the Lord, you'll be kept as well. You'll be kept from this wicked generation. You'll be kept from backsliding. You'll be kept from going back to the things of this world. You'll be kept from going back to your old way of living. Why? Because you'll call upon the name of the Lord. If you remember last uh, study of the 13th chapter of Psalm, uh, Psalms, David was feeling forgotten and abandoned by the Lord. And he could have easily done what was happening in chapter 14, turning aside and becoming corrupt. He could have thrown off uh, all his 
history with God and said, it's not working anymore. I'm, I'm all alone. I'm forgotten. I have sorrow. In verse 2, he says, or 13, sorrow in my heart all day long. But look at verse 3. He says, consider me and answer me, O Lord. What's he doing? He's calling on the name of the Lord. And as a result, verse 5, he says, but I've trusted in the steadfast love and my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord. That calling on the name of the Lord turned everything around. But here in chapter 14, the sad news is this, gen this uh, wicked generation is not calling upon the name of the Lord. The key difference between these two chapters is one calls on the Lord and God answers and hears the cry and resolves the turmoil of the heart. In 14, they don't call upon the Lord and there's none righteous. There's none, there's none that can be righteous if they call upon the name of the Lord. The difference between a righteous person and an unrighteous person is not their moral fortitude. It's their calling on the Lord and an imputed righteousness comes into us when we call upon the name of the Lord. And then we receive a knowledge of who he is, of what he's doing. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14 says, by reason of use, they have their senses exercised to discern good and evil. When you call upon the name of the Lord, what it does, it gives you a spiritual discernment. It gives you the ability to look at things in this world and say, no, that's evil. Look at this, and that's good. It's a discernment that we need. And so they watch over themselves to see if that discernment is still sharp, if they're still focused on the things that match the word of God. And that the righteousness of the holy righteousness has been imputed into them, that it's not works out external trying to become righteous, but they've become righteous by the power of the Holy Spirit. And now we guard our hearts, we watch over our hearts, we tend the, 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 the heart we have inside of us as well. Number four, they are, and this one is this one's my favorite. I just love this. This this is what you and I are in this hour we are living in. Verse five. Is, it says this, they are in great terror for God is with the generation of the righteous. You see a, a key change here. You see a, a shift in the whole focus of this chapter moving from a description of how bad things are. And we need to be careful as we look at the world today is not just be stuck in a description of how bad things are, but that we be a people that can contend with that, that have an alternative to that, that live differently, that are lights in the midst of darkness. And we see here that it says that they, um, there, they are in great terror. The first word is there. What, is, what does David mean, the psalmist mean when he says there? In other words, in this place or in this situation. What situation? The situation of understanding the corruption of their own heart, understanding their abominable deeds, understanding their lack of fear of God. And it's in that place that they are seeing there also now, they're seeing an alternative they're seeing a counterculture. They're seeing a holy remnant. They're seeing a small group of people in the midst of the influences of the broader culture that have found somehow the imputed righteousness of Christ, the gift of God given to them. And when they look at that, they're in terror. What a strange thing to say that you would be in terror because when evil sees that good is possible, the terror is that they realize in their heart is that there's a difference. And not only is there a difference, but there's an opportunity for a different way of living. They don't have to live in that abominable lifestyle. They don't have to live in that corruption. They don't have to live in that perversion. They don't have to live in that wickedness. They see it's possible to have another way, a way of escape, a way out. And so the, the terror is that it's possible. Uh, and, and, and not only is it possible, but part of the terror is this, that they know that it's possible, but yet they still are not choosing to walk in what is possible and what God has made available. I would say the terror or the shock of the, is, is that there's a whole world gone mad, living in vile, wicked godliness. And the striking reality is that the human nature is inherently wicked and that uh, none are righteous how devastating and how disturbing it is when we realize that we are hopelessly lost and at the core of us, there, there are none who are living as God created us to live. And yet a greater shock is this, that when God does look down upon man and sees the utter rebellion and the wickedness, 
rather than destroying all of us that he chooses in the midst of that, he chooses a generation, a remnant people, a people not righteous in themselves, not of a greater spiritual moral quality, simply one who's been given grace, one who's been given kindness of, and mercy of God, one who has been given salvation. So the shock, the terror is that they are living without God in a society and in a culture and in a generation where there is an opportunity to live for God, where there is a looking down of God upon man and he sees the wickedness, he sees the corruption, and he could like Sodom and Gomorrah or he could like Noah and the flood, he could destroy us all, but instead he chooses and says, I'm gonna raise up a holy people in the midst of that darkness. I'm gonna raise up a, a culture, a generation that contends, that confronts, that speaks the truth, that lives the truth, that loves the truth, that lives for the gospel and that causes the people around us while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that transformation in our life is not only a confusion to them, but it's a terror for them because they realize they have to make a choice now. It's not just, this is the way the world works and I'm just stuck in it. It's, no, there are two ways. There are two paths. Choose this day whom you will serve. Walk in the righteousness of the Lord. The terror of those living in sin is when they see that it is possible that there's a way to be righteous with God, that there's a righteousness by the cross of Jesus, not by your own works, but by the blood of Jesus to become part of a holy generation. And they look at you and they look and they see. And I wanna once again speak to young men and young women who are finding themselves more and more in a culture that is departing, turning aside from the way of the Lord. They see you. They see the way you men love your wives and your ch children. And women, they see the way you love and honor and respect your husband and your children. And they say, that terrifies me because I'm living in such a contrary way to that. And my family's broken and I'm so confused sexually and morally, it, 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 it causes them to be in confusion. They're, they're, it's a terror when they so freely want to advocate for abortion and they see you even in the midst of maybe a difficult season or even in poverty and in trouble and situations, but they see there's a righteousness inside of you and you keep that child and you raise that child and that child becomes full of joy and life and godliness and it's a testimony against them and that causes terror in their heart. When they give over themselves to adultery and you stay faithful to your spouse, it causes a terror to them. When, 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 when you're living honest when you don't cheat or you don't lie, you don't steal, when you're living like that, and the world is living that way, and they see, oh, it's possible for someone to be so touched by the power of the Holy Spirit that they can live an honest life in the midst of this horrible generation. It, it becomes a, a, it convicts them in heart. It, it condemns them in a sense, not that the Holy Spirit is trying to condemn them. He's trying to win them over to righteousness, but it brings a conviction when they see you stand firm, when they see you stay true, when you see, they see you unshakable, unmovable against wave after wave after wave of wickedness that pounds upon them, and yet they're standing true and saying, God, I resist all that wickedness by your Holy Spirit, and I stay pure and holy by the grace of God. That is a terror to them. When, you're see, seeing an, when they see an unwillingness in you to bend the knee to cultural norms, when the, the tides and winds and waves shift and get tossed to and fro. And the newest thing in culture is to, to believe that men can't be men and women aren't women and men can be women and women can be men and, and all that confusion. And, and they see that there's an unwillingness for you in you to bend the knee to these cultural norms. You believe men are men, you believe women are women, you believe marriage is between a man and a woman. And even though they might fight against you and speak against you, there's something in their heart, the Bible makes it clear, there's a terror inside them. It causes them to be convicted. And we pray then, we call upon the name of the Lord, God, in your mercy, in your love, draw them. Thank you, Lord, that you drew me out of a wicked generation. And you're allowing me by your grace, no, no good thing of my own, but you're allowing me by your grace to stand as one humble man in the midst of this wicked generation as part of the righteous generation. And now I pray, God, I, that my life would be light in the midst of darkness, that I would be salt in the midst of decay, that, that I would be all that you want me to be. Many are often 
Uh, another point about this is, listen to this. Many of us sometimes are frightened by what we see in the perversity of, uh, uh, of the world. When we see these horrible things going on, the wickedness, the agenda of the godly, the, the tactics of our government, the tactics of our education, of our entertain, the entertainment systems around, uh, just everywhere we go, even in sports and athletics, we see this flood of filth coming. And sometimes it can cause us to be frightened we, we can say, is thing, are things going to get worse? Or as I was talking about earlier about our children, we could be frightened for our children or our grandchildren. But here's some wonderful news. There's a reverse situation. And the reality is we should not be frightened of the world. The world should be frightened of us. Not a fear that says, I don't want to be around them, but frightened in the sense of uh, they, they, they begin to understand the conviction of the Holy Spirit and that they're living an ungodly life. The, the, this reverse situation is that it's, it's more true and powerful it is when the wicked and evil and godless are confronted with a righteous generation who are freed from captivity. And not only that, but they are winning battles against the forces of evil and the evil darkness and its agenda. The righteous generation, I believe with all my heart, it limits, it disarms, and it stands in the way of unhindered evil. It confronts evil. And by doing so, evil is afraid of the righteous generation. The, the wicked generation is afraid, is in terror of us because they know we hold the truth. They deny the truth of God, but they know it's a reality. They're denying what is, they're having, the, to, not, to, to deny means to suppress, to put down, to try to disbelieve what really deep in their heart they believe to the point they get calloused and eventually may not even believe it any longer. But I pray that we could be a good influence. We could be light, that we're not a holy remnant, that we're not a righteous generation just for our own sake, but that we could prove to the world through God's grace that there is a difference. There can be a light that shines in the darkness. And lastly, there are a generation that cries out for freedom and salvation. This results in a life of amazing joy and a worshipful gladness. Contending with, with the, the pervasiveness, prevailing winds of the worldliness is in this generation doesn't mean that we need to be downcast or uh, dreary or dull or weary or worn out. No, we can find life in no matter what's happening in the world. The Holy Spirit gives life. Jesus came to give us life and life abundant. That's what verse seven says. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion when the Lord restores the fortunes of his people. Let Jacob rejoice and let Israel be glad. The word, the word there, restore the fortunes, means bring out of captivity. It's a little bit strange as it's translated, restore fortunes, because it sounds like you were rich, and now you lost your riches, now you're going to become rich again, when in reality it's speaking about that uh, he's going to t bring us out of the captivity to the world around us. We're going to be saved, and that salvation will come from Zion. Praise God. It's not going to come through moral fortitude. It's not going to come through political uh, 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 ramifications. It's going to come through the people of God. It's going to come through people who are trusting God, but it's going to be coming, those people are going to receive it from Zion. Zion is God's holy hill. It's where God's presence dwells, and it's the presence of God that does these things. Nothing I've talked to you about that today is in our own power, in our own strength, or in our own righteousness. It's an imputed righteousness that comes from Zion, the salvation from God, the righteousness is from God. It's, it's God's righteousness in us, not righteousness of our own. And therefore, it restores fortunes in the sense um, I'm restored back out of captivity now and back into that inheritance that I have in Jesus Christ. The ultimate cry of those God calls is not that they become good or they stop doing bad things. Uh, it, it's not... Uh, just try to be right. Uh, all those things are good and they're true, but they are insufficient. We must be saved. We need salvation for outside of ourselves, we have no, uh, for inside of ourselves, we have no hope. Only outside of ourselves, the grace that's coming in from God to us. The cry is that something would come. It would come from Zion. It would not come from our own strength, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, say the Lord. It would come from Zion. Also, when he restores the fortunes or when he releases us from captivity, he's bringing us back to the place, that most holy place, that place 
uh, where, where once we were captive to unbelief, we were once disobedient, we were once rebellious, we were once in corruption, uh, we had a deep-seated refusal to seek God, to turn and trust in God. Uh, we were captive to these things, but hallelujah, a Savior came to our rescue. And as a result, I close with this. Uh, the last line is, let Jacob rejoice, let Israel be glad. The generation of the righteous are the most happy, joyful people on earth. They, they understand and they grieve over the vile condition of our nation, yet, it's, uh, uh, yet, yet uh, even with all the negative around them, they, they are dedicated to the condition of their hearts that will be filled with joy and gladness. When the Lord restores, he, when he gets us out of captivity, when he makes us a part of the righteous generation, let Jacob rejoice, let Israel be glad. There is worship, there is joy, there is celebration. Are, are you troubled over the corrupt conditions of the world surrounding you today? Are, 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 you, are you more conflicted and confused and focused on those things, then you are focused on what God wants to do for you, who God wants you to become, what he can make you become. Are you more uh, worried about the problems in America, or are you more focused on what God is doing in his holy hill from Zion, that he is, in this last hour, raising up a holy generation, a royal priesthood, that you and I can be a part of it? How do we do that? We humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God and say, God, I'm broken uh, without you, I'm part of this wicked generation. Without you, I'm corrupt. Without you, I turn aside. Without you, I can't maintain a faith in my own. Without you, I don't have knowledge and understanding. But if you would just come and, and give me grace, give me power, impute your righteousness to me, a, a righteousness I don't deserve. On the cross, you took all of my sin and you gave me all of your righteousness. And I'm part of a holy generation, a righteous generation, not because I'm acting righteous, although I believe I am, and part of what can come from that is we do begin to act righteous, but it's something that has been put inside of me, a new heart, a hunger to serve the Lord, a hunger to do what is right and holy and pure. Therefore, I'm not working in my own strength. I'm working in the strength that the Spirit of God gives us. Do you want to be part of that holy generation? Do you want to be part of this holy people of God? Do you want to make an impact on the world? Do you want to live not only holy, but make a difference around you? Do you want to draw others to the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? Do you want to glorify God by living this kind of life? Well, then I want to pray for you right now. And I want you to join me in prayer, just saying, God, do with me as you will. Work in me. Lord, I pray that right now. Work in me what I could not work in myself. Do in me what I cannot do in myself. Make of me what I cannot make of myself. Turn me where I could not turn myself. Keep me from turning aside where I could not keep myself from turning aside. And in doing so, God, you fill me with your presence from Zion, your salvation from the cross, and the power of the Holy Spirit to live a godly and righteous life. And I thank you, God. I thank you for old men and old women. I thank you for young men and young women, newly married couples who have young children. I pray for children and grandchildren, God, that in this hour, and I pray particularly for America, that in this hour in our nation, God, that you would raise up a holy generation. Lord, you promised to do that. This is what your word, whether it be David in the Old Testament or Paul's and what he writes to Timothy in the New Testament is that we can preach the word and we can reprove and rebuke and correct and, and, and be those pastors and leaders that you want us to be. But Lord, I pray for every single one who hears my words today. The words, I believe, would, would have connected clearly with the word of God, not my own words, but words right from your text and Lord, as that word has spoken to them, I pray, Lord, that you would put this spiritual hunger in their heart. Uh, if there's anything they need to separate themselves from, if there are any convictions that they bought into, if there's any compromise in their life, if they're partnering, if they are part of a, a church that is, they've been suspicious over the watered down preaching and the entertainment, and the showiness of it without any real substance to it. Lord, I pray that you would show them a better way Lord, if it's the only church in town, that's all they have, Lord, let them keep going, but let them go home from that church service and, and just be bathed again in the word and in prayer and in, and in seeking the face of God. Lord, I believe that one passage of scripture right in the middle of that 14th chapter that says they didn't call upon the Lord. Lord, let that be the demarcation of our lives. The difference of our lives is, is not our own self-righteousness, but that we called on the name of the Lord and he gave us something we didn't have of ourselves. And that, that causes us then to 
have that power to run and flee from the things we shouldn't be a part of, whether it be religious uh, part of the world or the worldliness of, of all that's around us, that we would find life and life abundant. Thanks, Jesus, for loving us. Thanks for saving us. Thank you so much. We rejoice now. God, I just want to take a minute to rejoice. Lord, we just take a minute to rejoice and say, thank you, God. Thank you for keeping us. Thank you for putting your hand upon us. Thank you for choosing us. We didn't choose you, you chose us. And now we conclude just by doing what Psalm 14 says, just out of Zion we rejoice and our, and our soul is full of gladness. We worship with gladness, God. The, the things around us are not so difficult that it would impede our sense of being full of joy and life, happy and content, and peaceful and joyful. We, we, we are joyful because of you, what you've done in our life. We give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us. Look forward to joining with you next time around in Psalm chapter 15. God bless you all.